Walter Sweetness Payton was much more than an all-time great NFL running back. The great Chicago Bears legend was born on July 25, 1954 in Columbia, Mississippi. Walter's family consisted of his dad, Peter, his mom, Eileen, his sister, Pam, and his brother, Eddie. It's safe to say that Walter came from an athletic family. Although his father worked as a factory worker, he also played semi-professional baseball, and his brother, Eddie, spent five years in the NFL as a running back for the Cleveland Browns, Detroit Lions, Kansas City Chiefs, and the Minnesota Vikings. Although Eddie was able to play at the highest level, Walter was able to outshine him in the NFL. Growing up, Walter and Eddie loved to get involved in any sports they could. Along with playing sports, the brothers liked to hunt, fish, and explore. The family grew up in a troubled area, so Walter's mom would give them projects to do, such as moving a huge pile of topsoil across the yard to keep the boys out of trouble. They grew up in a Baptist house where excellence was expected by their parents. Walter would sometimes disobey his parents' strict rules, but later on he realized that these rules were for the better. In an interview by Philip Kozlow, the author of Walter Payton, Walter said, My parents spent a lot of time with us and made us feel loved and wanted. I didn't care much about what went on around me as long as I was in solid at home. Growing up, Walter didn't have the best living conditions until he was eight when they moved into a house where he was finally able to have his own room. This is when Walter enrolled at John J. Jefferson School, an all-black grade 1 through 12 school. Walter loved the musical arts, which was his first real passion. He would often get in trouble for not doing his chores when he would instead sing and dance. Walter first started sports in high school when he joined the track team in the ninth grade. Even when he found his love for track, he was still passionate about music and played the drums for the school band. When Walter first became interested in football, he didn't play out of respect for his brother being the star player and because he didn't want his mom to worry that both of her boys had the risk of getting hurt. It wasn't until sophomore year that Walter joined the football team after his brother graduated. Of course, Walter couldn't forget about his passion for music, so he wouldn't play until the coach assured him that he wouldn't have to quit the school band. Walter's high school would now merge with the all-white school, Columbia High School. Walter obviously emerged as the true star of his team, and his coach Tommy Davis said, we can always count on Walter for a score. Walter scored in every game he played in his junior and senior year, which ultimately led to him being selected to the first team all-conference all three years he played. To no surprise, Walter was able to shine in every sport he participated in. He would average 18 points per game in basketball, had a 23-foot long jump in track and field, and played a little bit of baseball too. After proving his dominance in high school, Walter would follow his brother to Jackson State where he would play football. By the time Walter enrolled, Eddie was a senior. Walter would soon earn the starting role as a freshman and play alongside Eddie in the backfield. After Walter's freshman year, Eddie left for the NFL draft, leaving Walter alone to be the true star of the team. Walter was a jack of all trades for his new team. Walter would play running back, kicker, punter, and even quarterback occasionally. Walter would dominate his sophomore season as the nation's second leading scorer and even was responsible for 46 points in one game. After his sophomore season, he would lead the nation in scoring and ran for over 1,100 yards. His success in his second season led him to make the black All-American team. Walter thought about a lot of things that other didn't when he was training. He would run up sand hills, which would not only improve his strength and endurance, but helped his balance too. How he could just keep, keep going on and on and on like that. And then he once told me about his workout routine, his training routine, running, running those hills down in Mississippi on those deltas and burning out guys who'd come out to run with him, you know, track guys, burning them all out and torturing himself. Would you talk about how you go about conditioning yourself in the off season? What do you do to stay in shape? 
I can explain it in one word, but then you, I know what you're going to ask me, that you're going to ask me to explain it more. What I try to do is I try to kill myself. What do you mean? I work, work myself out to the extent where I, when I'm through, I can't walk. Peyton's conditioning regimen astounds people, and he keeps increasing his fitness program as he gets older. There's a steep hill near his home. It has become an obsession with him. The hill is probably, uh, you know, there are places around the country where you have the, uh, the widow maker and all this other stuff. But the hill is something that, that uh, if you had to give it a name or a description, it would probably be either a goal setter or a will maker. Because once you start working out on it, you set a goal. First, when you first start out, what's it made out of? It's made out of black dirt. You go out and it's it's already there. It's about uh, uh, sixty between fifty and sixty yards long, and it's at an angle where if you got halfway to the top and you tried to stop, you would probably end up slipping down. But it's what it is. Once you go there and you run it the first time, it uh, it humbles you to the to the extent that the next time you go there, you you got to beat it. You got to set it. So if you did five the first time, you go back, and your goal is to do six or seven to keep going, to always beat it. And see, you find yourself going to a point where it's no win for you. For many, the image of Walter and his hill will last forever. And perhaps it is fitting that no one else can ever claim to be king of that hill. It turned into a part three golf course. It's not there anymore. Walter's hard work would pay off his senior year. This year, he became the NCAA all-time leading scorer, made the black All-American team, and was announced to be a college all-star, where he would earn his notorious nickname, Sweetness. Continuing on his pattern from high school, Walter also would shine off the football field. Walter would end up participating in a televised soul dance contest where he would finish second. After an impressive collegiate career at Jackson State, Walter Payton was taken with the fourth pick in the NFL draft in 1975. When the Bears drafted Walter, he said, When I get through with Chicago, they'll be loving me. The owner of the Bears at the time, George Halas, said regarding this legendary Bears draft class, We certainly did one thing. We helped our needs. I'm so enthused with this whole thing. I think it's the finest bear draft in 10 years. After the 1974 season, the Bears were in desperate need of a running back. The Bears saw a lot of potential in Walter, saying they would have taken him if they had the first pick. They offered him a $126,000 signing bonus with his rookie contract, which at the time was the highest ever. Coming from a small town in Mississippi, it's safe to say that Peyton was thrown into the deep end, moving to Chicago. When Peyton first moved to Chicago, he mostly kept to himself. Later on, Walter would start to warm up to his teammates and be make good friends. Although the Bears saw something special in Walter, they definitely would not see that in the first game. He was held to zero rushing yards on eight attempts. After the game, Walter was seen crying due to this performance. Finishing off his rookie year, he would rush for about 700 yards and led the entire NFL in average yards on a kick return. Walter was definitely not satisfied with his performance his rookie year and wanted to work to become great. He would work hard to improve on many aspects of his game. He would improve his game in his second season, giving us a glimpse of a great player he was going to be. In his second season, he ran for over 1,300 yards, had 13 touchdowns, and ran for over 100 yards in seven different games. This year, he was selected to the first team All-NFL, and he was the NFC Player of the Year. Continuing to progress his game, the next season after this was one of Walter's best season, where he would win the NFL MVP. He ran for 1,852 yards, and set the single game rushing record with 275 yards. 
day that he uh, broke the single game rushing record. Before the game, he was laying on the floor in the locker room, covered up with towels, shivering and shaking. He had the flu. Here's Schubert. Wide to the left to Scott. Hand off to Walter Payton. Sliding on the right side. It's out of the 30 to 35 to 40. The 45 to 50. And out of bounds. The Vikings are in front. And there's a 28 yard run by a Mr. Explosion himself with the very first play of the ball game. Well, inside the Viking two yard line. Avalini with a call to give to Payton. Following his blockers. Trying to turn the corner on the right side. Gets into the touchdown. It was a good story because I used them, all my players all the time when they weren't feeling good. I was just telling them that Walsh just had the single game rushing record with 104 temperature. And so you need to go get dressed. Oh, inside handoff, big hole, pace up the middle to the 50, comes to the outside of the 45, comes up by the end of the cross of the 40 and down to the 39 yard line. Despite his physical style, Peyton only missed one game in his 13-year career. They've been going to Peyton all day. Peyton and Noah Jackson had the flu, but they have simply dominated this football game. Second down, eight the Bears at their own 32-yard line. They give to Walter again. Right to the outside of the 40. To the 45, the 50. To the 45, the 40. He's down the far side line. He's got two in the beat. And he gets the ball over the corner out of bounds. That gives Peyton now 269 yards. He is four yards away from O.J. Simpson's league record of 273. Fourth down, goal from the six-yard line. Deuce backfield, Avalini to Payton on a sweep to the right side. He's the block. He cuts back into the five and struggles down to about the two-yard line. Well, there's the rushing record. Walter Payton becomes the all-time single-game rushing leader in the NFL. It was the day he ran for 275 yards against the Vikings. He led the Bears to a 9-5 and five record, showing that this organization was moving in the right direction with him on the team. Walter is said to be one of the most complete players in NFL history and really brought the Bears together. He would work on every aspect of his game, making sure it was as good as it could be, and even played quarterback for the Bears in the game. Walter played every play with heart. Every single play, he never would run out of bounds like we see a lot of players do. He always thought getting a few extra yards could be the difference between his team winning and his team losing. Along with playing with heart, he played with toughness, only missing one game in his 13-year career, which is unheard of in the NFL. Continuing his success, Walter would go on to become the NFL all-time leading rusher after beating out Jim Brown for the record. But Walter still wanted one more thing, to win the Super Bowl. Following the season where he broke the record, the Bears were a very talented team. They had lovable players like William Perry, The Fridge, and Jim McMahon, but the heart of the team was still Walter. Walter kept the team together like he had done throughout his career. He led by example, would make jokes, and made sure everyone on the team stayed in line. With one of the best defenses of all time and one of the best running backs of all time, the Bears finished the regular season with an outstanding 15-1 and record. To no one's surprise, the Bears made the Super Bowl to play the New England Patriots, where Walter would struggle. On the first drive of the game, Walter would fumble. Although Walter didn't have the best game himself, he was able to make enough impact for, to set up his teammates. The Patriots would be so focused on Walter, they'd follow him, leaving other players on the Bears to make plays. Walter was upset after the game, although the Bears won 46-10, because he didn't get a touchdown. Walter would go into the locker room after the game and sit by himself, refusing to talk to the media until his manager convinced him that it wouldn't be a good look if he didn't talk to the media. Being the good man that Walter is, he didn't bash coach for not giving him a touchdown. You don't have to see the number 34 jersey to know that this is Walter Payton. Walter was there ever a time during your long career while you were performing so brilliantly and your team was at a level beneath that that you felt that this dream would never come true well you try not to think about it you know during the off season when now uh, you see people playing in the super bowl you wonder and you say to yourself are you ever going to get there and see what it feels like and uh then it pushes you a little bit harder during that off season to work to try to get there the following year this team had uh, had their minds made up after losing to San Francisco last year that uh, they we were going to win the Super Bowl this year. Can you describe the feeling for you personally? Right now, it really hasn't sunk in. I I don't feel anything. It's uh, it's one of those things where 
when you have it in your mind for so long what it would be like, and then after the actual event happens, you know, it tends to take away from it. Right now, I'm still a little bumped and bruised from uh, the game, and it really hasn't uh, happened yet. Did you ever have so much fun in a football season? Not just the winning, 18-1, and one, that's obvious, that makes it fun, but the cast of characters and the feeling surrounding this team. Well, I think uh, the reason we were 18-1 and one is because of, of that. Having different personalities, but yet still people with the same common goal in mind, and also people to uh, break some of the uh, pressure away. You got a guy like the refrigerator coming in, Jim McMahon, nobody knows what he's going to do from day to day. And on the defense, they're coming up with something new every day, so it's made it very easy for us to uh, play at the level we've played this year. Quickly here, you're already the career rushing leader, now you have a Super Bowl. In terms of goals, is Walter Payton's career complete? Not at all. I, uh, I would like to uh, end up with 18,000 yards. A little over 3,000 to go, right? That's right. That means another three years. Congratulations. When Mike Ditka was asked about the situation, he said, I would say that is my biggest regret. Walter was a man that got along with everyone, but he liked to keep his circle of friends small. Walter began to develop a good relationship with his fullback, Matt Suey. The two became best friends, and when Suey's son was born, Walter would be the godfather. Walter would get most of the glory on the field, but Suey always did his part to contribute. Walter would make Suey the executive of his estate, showing how good of friends they were. Although Walter grew up in a troubled area, he is thankful he did. Describing it as Disney World, where he could think and play all he wanted. Walter didn't have much growing up, and he thought kids at the time, during the 1980s, just went through the motions. Walter would have to use his imagination to have fun and play. Walter was asked if he thought he grew up poor. He said, not at all. Outsiders looking in would have said I was poor, but for me and the situation I was in, being able to at that time imagine myself doing great things, it wasn't a matter of being poor because it didn't take much to satisfy us and keep us content. For the most part, Walter's dad was an easygoing guy and wouldn't often get upset. He didn't care much if Walter or his brother messed up around the house, but if he messed up with someone else, his dad would have to discipline him. At the time, Walter hated that his dad would do this, but like most people say, looking back, he's glad that it happened. Speaking to his humble beginnings, Walter's first experiences playing football would be at the playground with a can with tape wrapped around it and even sometimes a stick. Walter's friends that he made in band would want to try out for football and not wanting to miss out, Walter decided to join them. Walter remembers the first touchdown he scored, not because it was really cool, but because of the lesson that it taught him. He said it gave him a pat on the back and kept him going to work harder. He thinks sometimes it takes a tough slap to the face to make you realize that it takes hard work to get where you are and you need to continue to work hard to stay where you are. After a teacher had told Walter he needed to find a good job in high school because he wouldn't be able to get through college, he became a motivated student and finished through college with all B's. Even though Walter had 64 offers for college for all the sports he played, including track, baseball, basketball, and football, he still chose to go to Jackson State due to something that his mother had told him. Walter recalls her saying, if someone tries to buy your talents, then they think very little of you as a person, as a product, and once said product ceases to produce, the person has no more need for you, and they go out and buy another one. Walter doesn't like to look up at the stats from his season because he doesn't want to become content with what he has done in the past. He always wanted to get better. He was never satisfied with what he had done. He always wanted more. Speaking to Walter's willpower, 
He believed that football is 85% mental, being able to learn from your losses. He used an analogy to describe his mentality, stating, you have to just say, I'm running a mile. I'm running 10 miles. Every time I complete one mile, I can't think I completed one mile. I got to think about I'm just starting. Because if you start to think I ran one mile or I ran two miles, then you start to get tired, mentally and physically tired. That's the same approach you use for football. Every week, it's a mile. When Walter would be injured or hurt, he would always think of other things to get his mind off the pain. When he would get an injury that would take most people three to four weeks to recover from, it would probably take him about three to four days. In college, Walter would meet his wife, Connie, after his coach had set up a date for the two. When he married Connie, it was the first time in his life that he was entirely happy with himself. He would grow his relationship with her by starting with what he calls the basics. Both partners wanting to give to the other more than they want to receive. Although Walter's profession required him to be gone for a good amount of time, he didn't let that affect the relationship he had with his family. When Walter was home, he would spend a lot of time with his kids, and when he wasn't, he would call three to five times a day to see what was going on. Walter credits a lot of his success on the field to doing the same moves he's done since he's been playing with a stick at the playground. When Walter would watch himself play, he didn't know how he did the moves that he did. He would only do them when he was on the field and seeing what he's seen a thousand times.
most famous workouts in NFL history, Walter Payton running the hill. He describes the hill as a goal setter or a will maker. He wanted to beat his previous goal every time. When he started, if he did it five times the first time, the next time he would go, he would have to get six or seven. Every day, he would always want to beat his old goal. He believed he could never beat the hill because he could always be improving. When asked about his off-season conditioning, Walter simply says, I try to kill myself. I work myself out to the extent where when I'm through, I can't walk. I'm so tired, it takes me 15 to 20 minutes to get ready or to get myself back together before I can leave. Walter is a pretty private man, so being in the spotlight could be a struggle for him. He needed to be able to stop and look around at the things going around him because he never forgot what he had to do to be where he is now. Being the superstar that he was, obviously the media was gravitated towards him, which would sometimes make him uncomfortable. When asked about his own faults, Walter said, not having the patience at some things I should have, keeping a lot of things inside me, trying to work out things myself before talking to others. Also, one of the things I cannot deal with is my temper when I find out someone is misusing someone else or taking advantage of someone else. He always wanted to do the right thing. So when dealing with anger, he would just walk away because he'd rather apologize for not saying anything rather than apologizing for something he said. Growing up in Mississippi, surprisingly, Walter said he hasn't experienced any racism out of the normal. He was able to avoid it from seeing it so much. Being in the city, it was hard for Walter to tell if someone liked him or not because people would use each other. But in Mississippi, he would always knew if someone liked him or not. Walter was an independent guy, but he believed when he is with the people he loves, they make him able to be happy and get through a lot of things. When he would think he might be above things, he would just go home back to Mississippi and his mom would put things back into perspective. When playing football, Walter didn't ever want to be intimidated. When someone would come up to him and him as hard as they could, he'd pop back up and act like it didn't bother him so that the other person would have doubt the rest of the game, knowing that they gave it their all and it didn't even phase him. Money was not Walter's primary concern. All he wanted from football was to keep getting better each year. Walter was definitely loved by his teammates, in large part due to his humor. His teammate and best friend, Matt Suey, spoke about it, saying, I had broke my thumb and dropped a pass in the end zone, and he walked up to me, and I was pretty dejected, and I was upset about it. Dropped a clear open pass, and he said, Listen, you can always join the Army or get a paper route. One of the two, and it really loosened me up a little bit. Two plays later, I scored a touchdown, so I enjoyed his personality. And you've heard of the pranks, and you've heard of the firecrackers, and the ability to pretend he's a girl talking with a very high voice. Not everyone can lead by getting you motivated. Some just do it by example, which is what Walter would do for his team. They said it makes them appreciate his greatness on some tough practice days. When asked about the Super Bowl, and if it was tough for him, Walter said, Not at all. It's just anticlimactic because I painted such a beautiful picture in the media. Also helped by doing that once the game started. If it would have been a lot closer, it would have meant a lot more. Walter had no hard feelings towards Ditka and knew that he was just doing what he could to win, which was most important for Walter. Walter recalls when his teammate Roland Harper retired. They were close on the field and he felt when he retired that a piece of himself was gone. He had taught Walter some valuable lessons about being selfless. Walter was asked about kids who are in a bad situation in a bad area, 
and what hope they can have. Walter said, The hope that if they believe in something, and if they believe in themselves, and not being led along by things that are happening around them, or individuals who come talking with smooth tongues and false promises and set goals for themselves, to look at certain individuals and think, that's where I want to be when I'm grown up, and they have to hold on to it. After Walter's retirement, Walter and Connie created the Walter Payton Foundation in 1988, a charity that's main goal is to help underprivileged kids in Chicago. When Walter retired, this was his main focus. He would spend his time and money helping children in need. Peyton did things such as co-founding a theater program for an elementary school. The mission statement. Our mission is to take an active role in helping those less fortunate to find stability while providing positive opportunities needed to live their lives with dignity and pride. In addition to programs already in motion, the Walter and Connie Payton Foundation continues to dream. New programs are being initiated to provide children and veterans with the tools and opportunities to live their lives with dignity and pride. The task ahead of us is a great challenge. Please carefully consider your involvement in working with us to impact the lives of those in need. The foundation does events such as Holiday Giving, The Sweetness Run, Veteran Project, and the School Supply Drive. I'm Brittany Payton with Mouthpiece Sports, and I'm here with my mom, Connie Payton Strotter. Can you tell us a little bit about the toy drive this weekend? Yes, uh, this Sunday at the at Soldiers Field when the Bears are playing Tennessee, November 9th is our annual toy drive where we collect toys, brand new toys for kids that are worth that award that are wards of the state. So we're hoping that everybody would come to the game on Sunday with a brand new unopened toy or socks, gloves, hats, because there are older kids in the system uh, um, up to the age of 18 and bring something to help us give Christmas to these kids and hopefully they can have a great holiday. Now do you accept or cash donations as well? Yes we do. We accept cash. If you happen to forget a toy and you want to make, make a cash donation it would be greatly appreciated too and then we can go out and buy gifts for these kids where we're lacking things but we're hoping to just be able to collect boxes and boxes of toys on Sunday. We really look forward to this because if we get one gift from every person coming to that game not only could we make this a wonderful holiday for the kids this year. We can also probably go into next Christmas for these kids and that's what we want to do. It's about giving back and making a difference and we want to put smiles on these kids faces this holiday season. Walter's charity led the NFL to rename their Man of the Year award to the Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year in 1998. This award has each NFL team name one player as their nominee. To be qualified, it's the players that have the biggest impact on their community. One player who received this award, Anquan Bolden, received this award in 2016. Similar to the Walter Payton Foundation, Anquan has his own foundation, which also works to offer opportunities to underprivileged kids, including programs to help students graduate on time, food drives, holiday shopping sprees, and scholarships. Ancon also worked to help with the hunger crisis in Ethiopia. I am joined on stage by my fellow Man of the Year recipients here tonight, and we are thrilled to welcome to this fraternity the 2015 Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year, Anquan Bolden. Thank you. Um, first off, I would like to thank the NFL uh, and the Peyton family, uh, Brittany, uh, Miss Connie, and Jared, uh, for voting me in. Um, you know, I, I've had the chance over the last two years to, to get to know the Peyton family. And what a great family. Um, I love what they do in the community and how they carry on uh, Walter Peyton's legacy. Um, I also like to thank 
uh, Dan and Joanne uh, of the 49ers for their tireless work um, and helping me do everything that I'm able to do uh, through my foundation. I know I'm here uh, receiving this award, but there should be a line of people um, standing alongside of me because my foundation doesn't work uh, without them. So I like to thank my entire board uh, for everything that they do, um, all the hours that they put in, um, and they do it all from the heart. None of them get paid. Um, they do it because that's what they want to do. Um, I like to thank my, my partner in crime, uh, my backbone, my wife, um, who's been there since day one, um, helping me do everything that I need to. You know, I've, I've played this game, um, just finished up my 13th season. And when I first got into the NFL, man, n nobody couldn't tell me anything. I was living life. You know, I had achieved my dream of, of one day making it to the NFL. But I soon realized that's not what life is all about. Um, I realized that my purpose in life wasn't to make it to the NFL and to score touchdowns. Um, God put me on this earth for something much bigger than that. And I realize and understand what my purpose is now. And that's to honor God in everything I do. On the field, off the field. So, you know, it's my prayer, my hope that, you know, I can live out the rest of my life honoring God. Um, I can help as many people as possible. Um, and once again, I'd just like to say thank you um, to the NFL and, and to the Peyton family for this, this tremendous honor. Ancon's speech shows how the Peyton family continues to carry on his legacy through their work in the community. On November 1st, 1999, Walter sadly passed due to bile duct cancer and liver failure. Walter's impact on the world is definitely not going to be forgotten. It isn't only remembered through awards or achievements. He's remembered for who he was as a person. After he passed, about 20,000 people attended his public funeral to show their respects. Walter is one of the biggest sports icons ever in Chicago. Going to Soldier Field, you see a Walter Payton jersey everywhere you look. The impact his charity has had on the Chicago community is still present today and definitely changed some lives for the better. Walter was a lovable person, and the NFL remembers him every year for the work he did off the field, motivating current players to get out there and help in any way they can. Walter is not someone who will be forgotten soon and lives on in the hearts of his family, friends, and the whole city of Chicago. He's a role model. He's my biggest role model and best friend. We made a wager who would be the first one to, uh, to break down in tears. And after hearing my son get up here and talk, I don't care if I lose the bet. Thank you.